Hi, my name is Hassan Sadri from Visionary Eye Institute in Newport Beach, California. And here we are with Nancy Lurker at OIS at AAO 2019 in San Francisco. Uh, I'm excited to see you again. I think last time we saw you in San Diego. Right? Yeah, thank you, exactly, exactly. Thank you very much, it's great to be here. It's a pleasure very having you. Meeting. It's always a pleasure seeing you. You're always smiling, got great energy. Tell us, what's, what are you smiling about? I know you got some you want updates Updates for us. Yeah, so we've we've launched our two drugs, DexaQ and UT, DexaQ for intraocular inflammation after surgery, uh, and that's primarily cataract surgery, so that's off to the races, and we're very excited about that. And then UT for posterior segment uveitis, which is our three-year intravitreal implant and uh, we are going to be presenting uh, some data because we have three two pivotal three-year studies that started reporting out at six month 12 month 24 month and 36 month they're like the, the studies that keep on generating data so we've got always a lot of new data and the most exciting is we now have recurrence rates out to 36 months versus what is technically called sham, but it's really standard of care because you can't deny care to these patients because sure. uveitis, I mean, causes blindness. So the vast majority of these patients all had rescue medication. And so when you look at our 36 month data of UTIC versus standard of care, what you see is that at 36 month, cumulative use of, uh, uh, cumulative recurrence rates for UTIC, um, zero, those who had zero recurrences, cumulatively, three years was 43.7%. But for sham, which is really standard of care, 7.1%. Wow. And then if you look at two or more uh, recurrences, UTIC only had 21.8, sham was 73.7. So it just shows the devastation this disease causes because every time you have a flare or recurrence, you know you're losing more of your eyesight. So we're really excited about just how this continues to be such a great product and the data just continues to be very positive for UT. Yes, and it's unique because you're doing back of the eye, front of the eye. Yes. And you're, and you're, you, we were just talking about how you're managing all that. T tell us a little bit about that as a, as a leader. How do you allocate resources? How do, what does that look like internally? Well, How do you we prioritize? yeah. So, you know, you look at your two your two products we're commercializing. So that's where a lot of our our investment is going because we want to make sure that patients and physicians both know how to use these drugs as well as get the word out about them. But then you also we we have a pipeline, so we need to continue to invest in that pipeline. So we are doing that as well with our our six month utique implant, which we expect to file this year, and then we also have our tyrosine kinase inhibitor program which is a six month bioerodible implant. That's still preclinical, but of course the goal there is that you get to once every six month delivery of an anti-VEGF for wet AMD. So what we basically do is most of our investments go into commercial right now, but we continue to, to, to put uh, uh, investment behind our pipeline as well. I feel like every meeting I see you got some new, some new pop, which is great, congratulations. Thank you. Okay, so tell us now, OIS. I know you've seen we've seen each other a few of these. What's we were just talking about that? That some of the possible recent changes coming up. But what is the value add for you? And what is what are your what are your thoughts on the future? One of the things I've said before is I ha my career in pharmaceuticals has uh, spanned all kinds of different therapeutic areas. So from cardiovasculars to CNS to women's healthcare, et cetera. When I came to ophthalmology three years ago, one of the things that so impressed me was OIS because I didn't see this in other therapeutic areas where you really bring together in one very dynamic day, industry, oftentimes uh, government, whether it's CMS, FDA, and then physicians and scientists. And what it does is, it's just a hotbed of creative interactions, business development, as well as communicating what the latest is with these companies and our data and what's going on. So it's just a tremendous interface of all three sectors of the industry. And as you know, it's one of the great things, if I may say so, about America is we do that really, really well. Absolutely. And you really need all three legs of that stool to be effective. Very, very true, very true. So. You know, and so people kind of, the young people are coming out, as we talked about the millennials, they want everything instantly. Everything is going to be done yesterday. How does a young uh, Nancy become somebody who ultimately can lead a company like you? Take us through your process. What, what Did you wake up one day and say, this is what I want to do? 
was your path like? So I did not wake up one day and say I wanted to be CEO because back then, remember too, you just didn't think that way as a woman. But I always, always very goal driven. So I knew that I wanted to have a career in in pharmaceuticals and in the business side of pharma. That I always knew I wanted to do that. So I set very clear goals. I overachieved those goals, but I set those goals, and then you communicate those goals to your wherever you are, I don't care if you're in academia or if you're in government or if you're in private industry. Communicate those goals. The other thing I would say is this, sometimes you have to leave where you are to jump to that next level because unfortunately, particularly I think when you're younger, you get pigeonholed as a certain way and you have to kind of almost leave those people who view you a certain way and go on to that next step. You've got to be willing to take risk. Yeah, so risk, you have to be risk tolerant. You have to be risk tolerant. Mm -hmm. Do you think that's innate or did you learn that? Well, that's a very good question. Uh, I would say for me, I've always been somewhat that way, but do I think you can learn it? I absolutely think you can learn it. But the biggest thing, and people know this because now it's talked about a lot, you have to have drive. If you have drive, you can learn to tolerate risk, you can learn from people, ask questions, but you, more than anything, you have to have drive, and when you're going to make mistakes. Sure. We all make mistakes. Yeah. And then you've got to be willing to pick yourself up, not let it demoralize you, keep going. and keep going. Very good. Well, with that said, I want to say thank you. It's thank always you. a pleasure. Thank you. Have a rest My of pleasure as well. Good thank you very much. Safe.